Well, the study of images is nothing other than the study of a particular form of fiction formation. And the point of view is that they develop a perspective on images which tries to negate or to undergo the differentiation, for example, between these both images. Both Husserl and Walton use the well-known uh, three-part division, tree partition. What do you see? Tree division, tree division. What is the word? Yeah, say it for me. <laughs> Tripart division: image carrier, image object, and image subject. For example, a picture. Uh, the difference between an image of a fictional person, for example, here a picture of Superman and an image of a real person, for example, a picture of Georgia Chalmers, a terrific musician. And I know she's living, I saw her on the stage. And from the point of view of Husserl and Walton, there is no difference. On the one hand, a picture of Georgia Chalmers would be a non-fictional picture if you take the normal side, because we would say this woman is existing, she's living in London. But both, Husserl and Walton see the it differently for the following reason. Both images consist, that's clear, by this image carrier vehicle, we, we all know it, and Walton, yesterday we discussed it a bit, of course it's as props, but for both philosophers, images have a reference, which is not the problem too, the image subject reference, call it as you want, it's not the point, and the problem is as is always a problem in our discussion, the image object. And the essential fictional character of any image, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> sorry, the essential fictional character of any image comes from the image object. This third aspect is that both philosophers distinguish about an image a picture object is this ontological, very special object. We just get discuss it a lot. Husserl is calling it a nothing. Yeah, the picture object is, exists only for the viewer of the picture, and the picture object is this object sui generis, consisting of pure visibility. Yesterday, all these important terms were mentioned. But that is now the, I would first say, weird perspective of both philosophers, both pictures. This one of Georgia Chalmers and this one of Superman do not show once a real woman and once a fictional character, but both pictures show ontologically equal picture objects, which has once a resemblance with a real woman and one with a novel character. Pictures are defined for both in the way they are objects on which a non-physical existing picture object is visible. Pictures are things that making believe to see something which is not there. And that means this single word to show here becomes the meaning of something becomes visible on an image carrier. The meaning of the word show in this context of Husserl and Walton too means something is becoming visible on an image carrier. So we have this, yes, Structure, there's an image carrier, don't um, talk about uh, words, bill trigger. But important is that the relation of showing is a relation between what is happening on the image carrier and what we can see as a pure visible object in or on a picture. This, this assertion that every image is qua image a uh, fiction is. Um, not an hermeneutical problem. You find clear statements. For example, quotation Husserl, the image object is a fiction. So that's not very problematic to understand. Quite analogous, Walton has opinion, I quote, any work with the function of serving as a prop in games of make-believe, however minor or peripheral or instrumental this function might be, qualifies as fiction. Only what lacks this function entirely will be called non-fiction. However, at a crucial point, 
it should also be said, the opinion of Husserl and Warden also diverged diametrically, namely when they turn the question of how it comes to this fictional character. We all know for Warden images are fiction because someone animates an image carrier very similar to Husserl, uh, to Sartre, and uh, Husserl, we find this very interesting idea that image objects are, as he writes explicitly, quotation, are perceptive fictions, perceptive fiction, perceptive fictionen in German, perceptive fiction. In an image, and only in an image, I can see something that is per image, car image, um, fiction. So a typical quotation by Husserl is, in the case of a perfect portrait, which represents the person perfectly according to all moments, indeed already in the case of a portrait which does this in a very insufficient way, we feel as if the person himself were there. But the person himself belongs to another context, like the picture object, the real person moves, speaks and so on. The image person is a rigid, mute figure. In addition, the conflict of the physical structure reality. So that's the point we discussed three, four meetings ago. The important point is a fiction has this structure of givenness as what she described als ob, quite as if. And that is the reason why we find in the philosophy of Husserl a differentiation between two forms of Nichtsein, he called it, nullity, nullheit. He is claiming every image object is a fiction, a quotation, but you also find the sentence, the assertion, the image is not an illusion. And that is very important for Husserl. He has a strict differentiation between illusion and fiction. And his master example for illusion is, we talked yesterday on it, about it, a wax figure. And his quotation, or quotation of Husserl, a wax figure in a museum is an illusion. And the difference with a pictorial object is obvious. The non-reality of the pictorial object is not that of an illusion. So we have a differentiation in non-reality. In how, how could we have contact, visible contact with objects which are not real? The image object is a fiction, but not an illusionary one. That is a quotation by Husserl. And now, I have the idea, and I would like to discuss it with you, that this clear categorical distinction may work as a clear categorical distinction, but very interesting forms of images are a sort of mix-ups. They are, they are combining it. And for example, I think this um, Giovanni Bellini, I think the Italian everyone knows it, is this, uh, from the uh, Frari Church, uh, Santa Maria dei Frari in Venedig. And the interesting thing is, Maria, I think, is a classical image object. Husserl would say it's a fiction, eine Fiktion. Yeah? But the frame in the background of Maria is painted too, and I have the illusion that it is a real frame. It's a real wooden frame. So we have here a combination of fiction and illusion. It's a sort of fiction in front of an illusion. And now, I want to show that if we have this categorical differentiation between fiction on, and the opinion that every image is a fiction qua image and an illusion on the other side, that we are yeah, slippery soap going into problems. When the word show is used to refer to the relation between the image carrier that was here, to the image carrier and the image object, also to say that something becomes visible on an image carrier is the meaning of the word showing, then we have a problem. Yes, imagine Rob. Rob, if you go to buy an incredible expensive bicycle on eBay and you have this photo and under the photo is written, uh, the bicycle, you buy what you see, what is shown. And after paying this thousand of months of money, you get the picture. And, uh, <laughs> and the guy is saying, yes, the picture object is sold. Haven't you read Husserl? <laughs> you should know. <laughs> you, sh you get what, you, what is shown. It would be crazy. It would be strange if you say, no, the picture object is shown. Yes? Uh, the view 
Und that the image object is the object is shown is contraintuitive to the everyday language. For example, the case someone claims in the view of a photographer, photography. This picture, um, oh, that's wrong. The, here's the way. This picture shows James Bond. Yet, it's a difficult case. James Bond, on the left side, you can say, this picture is showing James Bond because you have an image object that has resemblance with a person and it can be used after you see this visible object to take reference to Sean Connery in the year 1963 in his best years and to this fictional character James Bond in the film from Russia with love. Depending on the attribution of meaning and use, one and the same image is a fictional or a non-fictional image. So if under the picture it says James Bond, then it makes sense to speak of a fictional picture because it would be used to show a fictional person. So my opinion is we should, yes, defend this understanding of everyday life, that uh, a fictional picture is a picture where we have a reference to a fictional character. There may be some images where it is problematic. For example, Jesus' ascension. If you think that Jesus really went to the sky, then it's a real picture. If you think it's a myth, then it's a fictional image. It, there may be problematic cases, but I want to defend the everyday view that an image of James Bond is a fictional image. If photographs are images, now it becomes more problematic, but also more interesting. If photographs are images, then they are images in which the subject of the image is one of the causes which is causally responsible for the fact that there is an image object on the image carrier which bears a resemblance to that subject. I'm here all absolutely on one side with Dawn. I'm not knowing, is she really listening? Dawn, I'm on your side, that you cannot say that the reference is a product of the causal relation. No. But what you can say is that there is an image sujet, a reference, a real object in the world, which is the causal uh, reason for the effect that the image carrier is looking that way it looks. And this image carrier is visible, uh, this image, an image object is visible on this image carrier. And you know, especially Rob and we, we talked about it. I have the opinion that it's a sort of miracle. We do not know how it is possible that a physical object has the skill to produce an intentional object. I, I always say I'm, I do not know how it happened. It happens. I can describe, but I do not know why we can see image objects. And this image object is, and I would say, I would, would like to, I would like to describe this in some sort of normal use. Uh, in the case of photographs, to describe or to, to take reference to the image object, what was the causal reason for the image carrier. So, and Don, you are absolutely right. There are uncountable many causes, yes? Of course, the light of the sun is one of the causes why we can take, an, why it's possible to take a photo, but no one would say, oh, it's a photo of the sun. We take reference to this image object, uh, by the image object to a sujet, which has resemblance and is a cause, both has a resemblance and is a cause. The sun has no resemblance with a, with a face on this, as on the image object. This makes it clear. There is a priori, and I think philosophy, philosophy is always interesting when we start with talking about problems a priori. Uh, there is a priori no such thing as a fictional photography if we say we take the, I know it's a form of treatment, if we take the image object to take uh, reference to a sujet which has resemblance and was a part of the cause chain for the image carrier. Because if one has a photo of something, then this something has been existent. And that's why photographs can be used to prove something in the world. That's why it is usually yeah, buzzers well, that's why it usually bothers a husband significantly more when he sees a photograph 
of his wife holding, in a, holding a lover than a painting of his wife holding a lover. It is the most important, uh, yeah, uh, most uh, important to, to differentiate categorically between a picture and a photograph. Yeah? On the left side, we can say we have a photo of Sean Connery. On the right side, we can say we have an image of James Bond. There are pictures of Bond, but no photographs. The photograph of something can be used itself as a physical trace of that something that therefore cannot be fictional because fictional things leave no fictional uh, physical trace. Now, this is why it contradicts Husserl. He's right. All pictorial image objects are fictions, ontologically considered as a nothing. But the image, carry, uh, the image object on photographs or in photographs has a perceptive ficta shown by the image carrier caused by real existing things and therefore also a causal effect. And I think it, with this consideration now we have a perspective, or it seems to open up a perspective which is decidedly deter, determining for the contemporary world of images. The distinction between fiction and illusion which Husserl introduced and which is so profitable for the description of images returns in modern media world in a completely different form. Increasingly, that's my thesis I would like to discuss with you, in the media world we find images that are a kind of illusion, and that's the point, but not of a thing, but illusion of a medium, illusions of photography. It is about a difference that exists between these two images. Uh, of the comic character Transformers. On the one hand, we have a comic drawing, a panel, and on the other hand, we have a film still. From Husserl and Walton's point of view, both pictures are equally fictional. And it's interesting, in everyday life, we would say both pictures are fictional because this Transformer uh, is not existing. They are both images and therefore cannot be illusions. No one in this room is afraid of these things. So it's not illusion. No one thinks that this machine is coming. Only, and that is another important point, the one picture looks like a photograph. This is not true for the comic sheet. It is true for both cases. In both cases, the image object is seen with a contradiction to the image carrier. The illusion does not concern the image object. And I think that is this new phenomena, which I would like to describe as a phenomena special for digital photography, is concerned with the image, image object. No one is saying that this machine, yeah, Blumby Lee, or what is his name, is real in this room. One has an illusion of seeing a photograph. Of course, it does not come to the illusion that a viewer of this picture believes that this machine would really be present. But it comes to the illusion that one believes that a photograph would be here. And that I think is interesting. And this is not just a belief, not even a natural science. And that is really interesting. Not even a natural scientist in his laboratory could figure out whether this is a photograph or not, the right one, yes? In the face of digital photography, a phenomenon known from art history as photorealism is transformed. Yeah, I have two examples. The left side, yes, left side. It's from Kono. It's a it's a ball pen painting, a drawing. Yeah, very. It was new for me. It's from 2016. And on the right side, it's a very famous German painting from Franz Gerch, Christina. It's from the 80s. And this sort of images we normally call photorealismus, photorealism. And the important point is these pictures are not photographs. They are not photographs. So in my argumentation is the way these are not photographs and digital photo uh, photographs are not photographs, although they are called so, but in a different way. These pictures are not photographs, but a drawing or an oil or oil painting, respectively, the viewing of which is associated for the viewer with the impression of seeing a photograph. However, this means that there are three 
categorical different cases in which a picture can look like a photograph. There are three cases. In two cases of these three images, the image is not a photograph, just this photo in the middle. That is a photograph of Georgia Chalmers, this terrific musician, the saxophonist of, of Roxy Music. In the Gertz painting and in the Upono drawing and the Transformers image, we have images that look like photographs, but are not photographs in the classical sense, but in two different ways. The Ukono or Gertz image is a sort of trompe of a medium, a trompe of a medium. This is not a trompe where we think the person is here, but this is a trompe that we think a photo is here. The painting and the drawing are prime examples for photorealism, and in the case of the drawing, it is easy to see that what looks like a photograph is not a photograph. So in the language of Busa, we have a fiction of a fiction, a fiction of a fiction. Because if you go to this painting, you see it. If you go close, you can feel it. It's very easy to, to see that that is a painting. And my opinion is digital photography is a form of digital painting. It's a form of not of fiction of fiction, of illusion of fiction. It delivers images that create the perfect illusion of being photographed, even though, just like the image of photorealism, they are not. This illusion that one is dealing with a photograph, although it is a digital painting, is a media illusion that leads to images that are perfect suited to substitute the truth of deliberately false statements. And I think that's the reason why digital photograph photography has this prominent position in the media world and in world of fake news. For a photograph can be used as evidence of the existence of that which determines the appearance of the image carrier. That's normal. We take it as an as in truth that, that you have been there. I show a photo, you have been at the Eiffel Tower and I show it. Yes, it's uh, every day. And which produce an image object, which I can refer to the Eiffel Tower, for example, that bears a resemblance and yeah, the, uh, is a cause. But the illusion of evidence, and that's the point, is not an evidence. The illusion of evidence is not an evidence. If someone wants to claim that there is this machine called the Abamblibi in the streets of New York, they could use a real photograph as evidence. If you bring a photo from New York and say, look, we have this machine in our streets, it would be an evidence because I think it was a cause for the effect of this image carrier. Something that is a photo illusion can be used as an illusion of evidence. And I think that is a real problem in the media world today. It's never the picture itself that lies, because pictures never claim or say anything. Nor does pictures say more than a thousand words, which, by the way, are not so that much words. Yeah? Yeah, because pictures talk and assert nothing at all. But the media illusion of an as-if photography creates picture objects in which the experienced fictionous character of the picture object change. Despite the knowledge that what we see here looks like a photograph, but it is not a photograph at all, despite the knowledge of the possibility of being deceived with manipulated photographs, the illusion of photography also has the reality effect as an experience. And that a phenomenal approximation occurs. The media illusion, so I do not say that this image is an is a illusion, that would be rubbish, but it's a media illusion, it's an illusion of a medium. The media illusion leads to the fact that non-photographs, like photographs, are experienced as traces of a reality, which ultimately means falsely experienced as evidence of a reality that did not exist. And this is only possible with photographs. Therefore, one can say there is no fictional photography, but there is the illusion that something is a photograph. There is no fictional photography, but the illusion that there is something a photograph. And this cannot be decided by examining the images. 
The possibility of illusion formation is not available to language. That's interesting. You cannot do a language illusion that I have the illusion you are speaking. If you are speaking, you are speaking. But I can have the illusion that it's a photographer and it's, it's, it is not a photograph. And that's, this is what gives digital images in the contemporary world, I think, a special significance and you feel or see it that I would like to describe the significance with phenomenological method more precise for the formation of fictions, because fictional image objects are produced that look like traces of real things without being them. It might be difficult to escape this danger of illusion formation through images. It poses a particular challenge, I think, and that's a little bit my perspective I would like to work on, on uh, what we call in Germany median competence. And uh, Eva and Ludger, I think we have more or less in the same time Abitur gemacht. And, and, and median competence, it was such a huge word in Germany. In every lesson you heard, you need median competence. Median competence is the most important thing. Nowadays, it's nearly forgotten. forgotten. For the only thing that helps is a knowledge that the so-called digital photography are not a form of photography. And that one believes in the truth content of digital photographs, like one believes the truth content of linguistic statement, must depend on the credibility of the producer. That means that we are approaching and coming closer and closer in the world of pictures, a situation we have always had in the spoken world, in the language world. If you say, Rob, I saw a dog in the, in the garden two hours ago, uh, why, why is it true? I just can believe you. It's, it's your credibility that <laughs> would be a reason for me to believe. So there is no possibility to link spoken words with the reality in a way that they prove that they are true. <laughs> it cannot exist, this, this sort of media we do not have. We have it with photographs. And now we have this problem that in the case of digital photography, we have one and the rare, rare cases that, the, that we have a misnomer. The name is, is an absolutely catastrophic point name. Yeah, it would have been a thousand times better if the so-called digital photography had been called what it is, digital painting and we have to learn to see it as a form of painting. And I would like to discuss this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lambert, for your talk. Uh, we have here some questions. Uh, you know the rules also. Uh, maybe we can uh, come back in. Uh, Ah, this one, okay, perfect, perfect. Voilà. Okay, you know the rules. Uh, 